I built my dream bike and I'm not a bike mechanic. It's a titanium hardtail mountain bike and you could do the same. Hi, welcome to the channel. In this video, I'm going to attempt to assemble a Linsky live wire hardtail titanium mountain bike. Several months ago, my mountain bike broke in half when I was riding at a place called Fort Ord. I haven't been able to ride mountain bikes since. I've got some other bikes to ride. I, along the way, I picked up this frame and a bunch of other parts and some of the parts that were on my other bike I'm going to use to try to assemble this Livewire Linsky bike here. It should be a super nice bike by the time it's done. The other bike was a full suspension bike. I'm going to be going to a hardtail mountain bike instead. Um, I've decided to document this. If this video comes out good enough, I'm going to share it with everybody. So if you're seeing it, I felt like it came out well enough. I'm going to go through the steps, document all the different processes I go through, and hopefully come out with a good series of videos that show the average guy can actually put together. I, I have worked on bikes over the years, and I did assemble a bike basically almost by myself. I had to get some help on that other one, and I'll show it to you. Let's see if the average guy that has a few bicycle tools and some regular tools can figure out the ins and outs of putting a bicycle together. And from my mechanical background, I didn't have to be that careful with torquing stuff. And, and in other words, the word, work I did, I could um, go at it pretty vigorously. With a bicycle, you've got to be careful, especially you don't want to screw up a titanium frame that's pretty expensive. This titanium frame, this Linsky live wire, it's made handmade in Tennessee. I waited for a month or two to get it after I ordered it. Um, definitely don't want to screw this up. It'd be really hard to get another one and it would cost a fortune and it would be very disappointing. So anyways, in this video, hopefully I'll be able to show you a few tricks that I've learned along the way and some that I'm going to learn and we'll see if the average guy can actually build a decent bike. Linsky Titanium Bicycles are made in the U.S. in Chattanooga, Tennessee. This frame is a Livewire hardtail mountain bike, size medium. The frame has a 73mm wide English threaded bottom bracket. The frames are hand welded and all the welds are beautiful. It's a 148mm boost frame with a through axle in the back. The frame is set up to run the dropper post cable internally. The frame is designed for 29 inch wheels, but it can use 27.5 plus tires. It's happiest with a 130 to 140 millimeter fork. Next up, I'll unbox some parts and show you an extensive parts list. I wanted to use as many USA made parts as I could on this bike build and Chris King is a premier US bike part manufacturer. This is a Chris King 30mm thread fit bottom bracket. The bottom bracket is labeled drive and non-drive side. It's also labeled with a torque spec and the arrows show you exactly how it should be threaded into each side of the bottom bracket. A Chris King bottom bracket tool is required for the installation. 12 teeth that fit perfectly into the 12 indentations on the Chris King bottom bracket. The tool allows you to install the bottom bracket without doing any damage. Installing these bearings into a titanium bottom bracket requires some special procedures. 
Linsky recommends using copper anti-seas, but ParkTool ASC1 anti-seas is also rated for titanium builds. You'll want to have a torque wrench available when you're installing your bottom bracket to be sure you've got it torqued just perfect. The frame is faced and chased at the factory, which means the threads have been cleaned up with a thread chaser, and the sides of the bottom bracket shell have been made exactly square with each other. Linsky recommends applying Teflon plumber's tape to the bottom bracket cups before installing. That is in addition to using the anti-seize. I applied anti-seize to the threads on the bottom bracket shell in the frame and also onto the bearing cups. There's a sleeve that goes in between the bearing cups and that should have a light amount of grease applied to each end of it. I realized after I installed the bottom bracket that I should have added a 2.5 millimeter spacer to the drive side of the bottom bracket. I had to take it apart and redo this install all over again. It's critical to get the bottom bracket cup threaded in perfectly. Cross threading could damage the threads on the bottom bracket cup and the bottom bracket and that would be a total disaster. When you've got the bottom bracket cup installed as far as you can by hand, that's when you have to pick up your bottom bracket tool and start applying greater force to get it to spin. The bottom bracket comes with a spacer chart, which is pretty difficult to interpret. Not installing the spacer made it so I could not get the sleeve to line up properly in between the bottom bracket cups, and therefore I could not get my axle through for my crank set. It was pretty frustrating because I thought I had read everything and done everything properly, but I finally had to break down and call Chris King, and that's when they advised me I should put the 2.5mm spacer on the drive side. After that, I was able to get the axle through. There are several different spacer and shim kits available to use with this Chris King bottom bracket. That allows this Chris King bottom bracket to be used with a variety of different crank sets and bottom bracket axle diameters. I'm installing a 30 millimeter axle, so I'm using the 30 millimeter shim. The axle will never actually touch the bearing. It will be always constantly in contact with the shim. Apply a little grease to the shim and pop them in and that's all it takes. Now this frame is ready to have the crank set installed. But first I'm going to install the Marzacci Z1 fork. I decided to install a Marzacci Z1 bomber fork on this bicycle. I knew it would be heavier, but it would also be very stout and would take a lot of abuse. I had the Cane Creek headset installed at the Linsky factory but I still would have to install the crown race on my new fork. It's not a difficult job, but you have to make sure you install the crown race with the proper side up and don't damage it while you're installing it. First, you apply a little grease to the fork underneath where the crown race will sit. There's an expensive tool you can buy for driving the crown race on, but I made one out of PVC that's the same diameter as the crown race. It's very cheap and it works effectively. With the crown race installed, now I could get a measurement on where to cut the fork steerer tube. If you're replacing a fork on an existing bicycle, you can simply use your old fork to get your measurement from. Since this is a new fork going on a new frame, I inserted the fork into the head tube, installed my spacers, installed my stem, and the spacers on top of the stem, and that's where I would make my mark where I would cut the steerer tube. A plumber's pipe cutter is an awesome tool for cutting the steerer tube. You can use a hacksaw to do this, but you might not get as straight a cut as you do with the pipe cutting tool. Be careful using the pipe cutting tool, just take small bites, that way you get a better cut. Use a file to clean up the edges on the steerer tube 
making sure not to let the shavings fall onto your fork stanchions or your seals. Now the star nut can be installed into the top of the fork. The star nut is where your top cap bolt threads into to hold everything together. I've made homemade star nut insertion tools, but this park tool worked a lot better. It was a lot easier to use. The star nut tool allows you to make easy corrections as you're driving it in to make sure it ends up perfectly straight. The star nut will actually end up at the perfect depth inside the stereo tube that you need it. Now it's time to permanently install the bomber fork. Add the bottom bearing from the headset to the fork. Insert the fork. Add the top bearing to the fork. I did not file the top of my fork as well as I should have, so it was a little difficult to get the top cap assembly on. I had to use my rubber mallet to kind of help drive it right on. It's not exactly what you're supposed to do. I should have filed the top of the steerer tube better. Got a little messy because I added too much grease, so I had to wipe that all off. After wiping off the extra grease, it's time to add all the spacers, the stem, and the top cap bolt. The bolt on the top cap is actually a preload bolt, which preloads the tension you need on your steerer tube. Had to break out the rubber mallet again to get the stem on. The preload adjusts how much tension there is on the fork while you're turning it. Here I switched out the stem to an Industry 9 stem, which is a beautiful piece of aluminum made in the United States. Making real progress now on this bike build. I wanted to reuse my old Shimano rotors, but my local bike shop advised me that since I was installing Magura brakes, I should use the Magura rotors, which are actually a little thicker. These are lock-on rotors as opposed to the six-bolt rotors. There are a couple different tools available to use to install the lock-on nuts. These are the 27.5 inch or 650B wheels that were on my old bike. They're an awesome set of DT Swiss M502 wheels. With the new rotors installed on the wheels, it's time to install my new 12-speed Shimano cassette. This is where I learned that 11 and 12-speed Shimano drive shells have a different type of splines. It came as kind of a shock when I found out when I tried to install my new 12-speed cassette onto this, this, my old wheels, which I wanted to use from the old bike, the M502 27.5 or 650B wheels, when I realized my new cassette wasn't going to work. This is the old cassette, the old 11-speed 5111 cassette. Um, works perfectly fine with this free hub. What I didn't know is that I could do a free hub upgrade. Because I had these wheels upgraded at the Sea Otter to the DT Swiss, ratcheting system, I was able to go down to my local bike shop and pick up this DT Swiss 12 speed spline, micro spline free hub. And this micro spline will accommodate the 12 speed Shimano cassette. And it's really simple. You just pop the old, the old free hub off, the old 11 speed free hub off, and you just set the new one right down in there. That'll go like that. It's popping up a little now because the spring is pushing it up, but when you put the new cassette, not this one, because this is the old 11 speed, but when you put your new 12 speed cassette on there, the lock ring will hold all this together. That was a simple fix. Putting the 12 speed free hub, or yeah, the 12 speed micro spline free hub on here. As it turns out, I ended up getting a new set of wheels anyways. Uh, that's a different story for a different reason. I didn't want to, I wanted to save a lot of money by getting using this wheel set over again. Didn't do it, ended up having to buy a set of wheels anyways. But that's that I'll tell you about later on in the video, why I did that. One of the big decisions you're gonna make when you're building a bike is the crank set that you're gonna use. I decided to use this rotor cabot crank set with an oval, 34 tooth oval chain ring. Now the big deal when it comes to crank sets is chain line. Chain line is 
I'm not going to get into it, try to explain it. There's better people that do it, better exp explanations you can find. The chain line is the distance from the center of your frame to where these teeth are. And that has to be right or you won't shift properly. So you have to have, I think this one's 156 millimeters. So I had to come out with this chain ring at 156 millimeters. It's all about the spacers that you use. They give you spacer charts, but what happens is every situation is so different that there's just no way for them to make a chart that tells you what kind of spacers you're gonna need for your for your particular setup. Or Rotor wants you to have this installed at a bike shop, your local bike shop. It's gonna save you a lot of headaches if you did. The whole deal is figuring out what spacer goes where to get it to come out perfect. Because the actual installation of the crank is a piece of cake. It's making sure everything's lined up and you have the correct spacers in there. So if you decide to go with a crank like this, definitely either have it done at your local bike shop or maybe get something a little less complicated. show you the rest of the parts that are on this bike but there's better videos that you can find for installing things like this m8100 shimano derailleur 12 speed and i go to free to cycle he's the guy that i go to when i'm doing all my repairs on my bike and he's the one i used his video i used for installing the m8100 derailleur and the shifter which is right here and getting that all dialed in free to cycle there's the cassette 1151 gives you huge climbing gear in the back KMC chain, that's the only one I'd use. I got a chance at the Sea Otter to talk to the KMC guys. I uh, really believe they're the best chains. Totally unsponsored opinion, it's my opinion only. And I installed these Magura MT trail brakes on my bike with a four piston caliper in front, two piston caliper in back, and there's a specific way to install these. And the best video without me trying to show you is by going right to Magura and seeing how to install them because it requires cutting the brake lines. So you cut these brake lines and you reinstall them and you don't have to bleed it. You don't lose any fluid when you do. Always leave my uh, calipers loose in case you crash. Instead of them breaking, they'll just move. This race face affect dropper seat post was left over from my other bike and I just added this shim right here. It was smaller than this seat post, seat tube. So I added that shim to it and this worked out perfect. Got my old seat, old Ellsworth Wilderness Trails bike seat. I changed the 29er wheels. I bought this Chris King Stands Flow wheel set. The reason I had to go to 29ers was because I kept getting pedal strikes. Pedal strikes hitting rocks, hitting logs, stuff going over them in the woods. So I just went ahead, bit the bullet, and I got these beautiful Chris King Stan's wheels, and they are awesome. Tried these tires out for the first time. Terravale Warwick in the rear, 29 by 2.5. Terravale Kessel in the front, a 29 by 2.4. These really hook up around here. Hard pack trails with a little loose dirt. These things really dig in. You can see these side knobs. Let's see how much it weighs. So I got the bike here on the scale, and this is a pretty heavy hardtail, 30.53 pounds. But yeah, it's a pretty heavy bike. Don't think that this titanium bike is gonna break in half like my old Ellsworth did. Here's the finished bike. It's the fastest bike I've ever ridden downhill. It's the best cornering bike I've ever ridden. And I'm really happy with it. And I plan on riding it for a good long time. Thanks for watching my video where I built my titanium hardtail dream bike. Check out some of the other content on the channel. I'll see you on the next one. And don't forget, the best is yet to come.